Jupiter and new media to reach a wide, non-specialized audience and bridge the two cultures of science and the humanities. Uh, and now, without further ado, please welcome the director, co-writer, and co-star of BlackBerry, Matt Johnson. Hello. And our special guest, Vas Bednar, who works at the intersection of technology and public policy as the executive director of the Master of Public Policy in Digital Society program at McMaster University. So before we start the sciencey questions, um, I was misinformed. This was not the first Canadian screening of the 35 millimeter Blackberry. This, no, this print just got struck. I know Tiff loves this, eh? <laughs> Any little thing they can get, they're like, oh wow, isn't it just so remarkable? But wow, look how happy they <laughs> are. This was the world premiere. I know, but this is such a cinephile thing. Uh, there's somebody who works in our office named Ben. Shane, look him up. S look up how many times on Letterboxd he's seen the film Oppenheimer. <laughs> if, you want, if, you really want, if you really want to have your mind blown. This is in theaters, by the way. And there's a certain like fetishism about being there for the premiere. I was there when it was first screened. This is an inexhaustible resource. This can screen an infinite number of times forever. So saying that you saw it first, actually, what am I saying? I'm degrading this audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean, you know. <laughs> I was waiting for you to get there. It's, uh, it's not. I guess it is great, yeah. Did it look good? I didn't, I've never seen the full 35 print. Did it look okay? Was it? Yeah, we did it just for this actually, and then we're doing some screenings with this print uh, in the United States. Because what's amazing is that again, uh, the, uh, the, this modern cinephile movement, which I think is entirely powered by Letterbox, uh, truly, I know it seems like a joke, but it's it's, it's had like a revolutionary impact on on the world because people are going back to. 35 millimeter prints of new movies that will, there are certain theaters that will only screen 35 mm -hmm. that we wanted to screen at. And it's because of this new young generation who are like, ah, uh, this is how I can get dates. It's <laughs> 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 by having arcane cinema knowledge yeah. on a site where I can post whatever I want and other people will like it. Uh, I was a cinephile in the early, late 80s, early 90s. It, that did not work. Um, mm. The arcane knowledge does not work. But, science question. Um, we have just watched Blackberry in a 35 millimeter print, which, uh, which I think is incredibly delightfully perverse that a digitally constructed film uh, now exists on celluloid. Um, but I wanted to ask um, specifically how making the film digitally and how making, you know, you've, you've been working with, you've been directing features and, and, and even before that you've been working on shorter projects uh, on digital video and various other formats over the, the last, what? 12, 13 years. So we talk about the evolution of, of the tech and if there's evolution that's really helped you in the, in the creation of, of the way you make your movies? I was from a very unique generation and that was the generation that uh, entirely did film school on film. I think I was maybe the last that cut on film and shot on film. In fact, I went to York University um, for my undergrad and my master's. Yeah, it's a great film department. I teach there now. That's, that's what a success I became. <laughs> now I drive the school bus. Um, uh, and we, were f we had to shoot film. You weren't allowed to shoot digital. And so it was really an amazing transition for me to have gone through that as a student and then immediately be launched into the digital age when everybody was just shooting digital and it was seen as ridiculous to shoot film. And I, I feel really grateful that I got to do that because I really enjoyed feeling like, oh my God, video is special. And it means that I can do things with video that you just can't do with film, which really is true. Like, it's so much easier to shoot in public. It's so much easier to shoot when people don't know they're on camera. And you can shoot forever. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about only shooting for 11 minutes at a time. And, and so you were talking about this film in particular. I think that I, whenever I'm approaching any project, I'm always trying to use the format of long form video as best as it can be possibly used and not just think of it as the film format. Like it's, it's, 
I don't think of it as just, well, that's how you make movies. I think, well, what can digital video do that you can't do if you're shooting film? But I think that only happens because I didn't go to school shooting video exclusively. Yeah. So it opened up new possibilities. Yeah, well, I mean, I think of it as a tool as opposed to, it's like, I, I don't think of it as that the water that I swim in, it's not like the only option. I think of it as having very unique properties. And that's why, I mean, in this film, so much of what we were going for, what my editor, Kurt Lobb, says is that, like, our process is so much about waiting until something happens by mistake, and it's very difficult to do that with the precision that you need when you're shooting on celluloid. Mm. And so to be able to shoot in a random, almost chaotic way where you're, you're hoping something goes wrong, y y almost it would it's not impossible, but it would be so irresponsible to do with film. Where with video, you can just leave the cameras rolling all day and not tell the actors, not tell anybody, and then wait until something interesting happens. Uh, Vass, you were... It's like, Vass, and you're on this panel, too. You know what? You I said you had <laughs> something for this. <laughs> yes, I had a little bit of a fun fact here that mm. I wanted to offer that you probably already know. But back in 1994, when you and I were hoping to become Ninja Turtles, I think. Forget teaching at York University, that's what I was into. Um, uh -huh. The company, Research in Motion, RIM, uh, won uh, an Emmy Award and was nominated for a technical award by the uh, Academy for the DigiSync film they won, they won reader. That Oscar. And they, they won that Oscar. Yeah, they got that Oscar. So I just thought it was this like nice little tie back where we're talking about you know, a device and, and one particular company, but that they had this little contribution to the world of cinema as well. Yeah, the, it was a, a product called DigiSync, which back in the day when you shot film, there was numbers along the side of it. They're called edge codes. And when people would encode film, those ed edge codes would be how you sunk things up. I mean, technically, I don't know exactly how it worked, but they created the software that did that seamlessly. And in the original script of this movie, Mike's main storyline was around that Oscar. Like that's, that's, uh, that's how much a script can change from when you're first like, I know what this movie should be about versus when it's finished. And if you watch closely in act three of the film, um, specifically when Mike takes that Blackberry that he's trying to redesign and whips it at the wall, it hits his Oscar. <laughs> and so his Oscar, w Adam Belanger, production designer, had to build that technical Oscar from scratch because they don't look like regular Oscars. They look very bizarre. Mm -hmm. And it was so important to me for some reason that we have it <laughs> uh, because I was like, oh, yeah, this guy won an Oscar. Like, we should honor that. And, uh, and all that remained from that part was that he whipped a Blackberry at it. And it was so, we only had one of them. And so I think it broke. That's back in the 90s. So he'd he was like allowed to do this. You know, he was in charge of them back in the day. And so he gets up on stage and he said, I remember the quote very well. He was like, you know what? This movie sucks. And I want you to know, research in motion, we got an Oscar. And you never will. <laughs> And, it, and he kept getting madder and madder because his burns were not having the desired <laughs> effect on me because I was really just like, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> Look at this guy. Um, uh, and yeah, so he was spiraling. But uh, an interesting guy. I actually think he's now suing us. <laughs> For not You're, treating the Oscar with enough respect? No. Well, you know, because you know, when nothing works, you got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, escalation is absolutely the core of... Uh, of of, of, uh, of good coding. diplomacy. Yeah. Well, that actually lines up with, the, with one of the questions I have here, um, which is the, the tug of war between science and profit, like the idea that they have this magnificent thing, and whatever it takes, the world has to have it, but also the world has to pay for it. So there's the, there's the, um, the visionary, uh, the, the breakthrough, really, of, of using, the, of using the, the carrier signal and, and figuring out how to push email, but also the zealotry that comes behind the creation. You know, like there's, there's no cult of Mike, even though there should be. He's a visionary in the movie, and, and the movie treats him as someone who is this sort of tormented genius. But he can't, like, Mike and Doug are creating gizmos by thinking outside the box and, and, and really changing the world, and Jim's first instinct is to box them up, is to put these products in a box and market them. So the, the push and pull, the back and forth, like, is there, like, the last shot of the movie is Mike forcing, you know, like, forced by his own compulsion to make things perfect instead of just okay, to open those boxes up again and fix things one by one. And I still don't know if that's heaven for him or hell. He seems really 
driven, but I also know it's the thing that makes him feel better to finish each pro each job, to solve each puzzle. So is there a place for someone like Mike now in the in the world where, let's say, certain tech visionaries really just say that the thing works and it doesn't matter if it does? Y look, that's a true philosophy of, of Silicon Valley. One of the big quotes that was in the original draft of this script, which is a, uh, a Guy Kawasaki quote, but I think it's misattributed, which is that in tech you need to jump and build your parachute on the way down. And I think that that's deeply true. Like that's just how innovation works. I, this movie has a few examples of that. Like we, we tried to make an analogy to that when Jim is like, you need to build this thing in one night. And the fact that they need to build it in one night out of toy parts is what gets them to actually do it. So I, I believe in that. I fundamentally believe in that. I think that for some reason, knowing myself, I need that kind of motivation in order to do certain things. I also think that's when magic happens. I think in some ways this whole movie is, well, I won't say what it's trying to say, but like I to me the most innovative, exciting, brilliant moment of all of these guys' lives occurred that night that they stayed up building that prototype. And all their success came from one night in this tiny office in Waterloo where they stayed up all night fucking around with toy parts. And I believe there's something deeply true about that. I know that all my best work has that exact same kind of genesis. I know that there's something about like the heat of the moment, like this individual feeling of, okay, no, we have to do it now, we have to finish it now. And, and the ripples of that being unbelievably powerful. Um, but you were bringing up the, so the cost or the price piece of that. And uh, the movie's trying to deal with that too, which is that film is like this, you know, the intersection between art and commerce I think film hits in a way that not many other art forms do, right? It is a direct like consumer product where the people who come to see it in, in movie theaters or who rent it are the people who determine its value, you know? And, and I think that to ignore that or to be like, oh, that is a failing of the capitalist system or that, that is a, that's a problem, I think is kind of wrong because I think that art gets its positive signal from attention and audiences. And it's audiences that say, ah, oh, this has value. And it's not filmmakers or artists who are like, I've made something of value, you know? It's always gonna be the public that determines if something is, is worthwhile or useful, I guess is maybe the better word. Is it useful to them? And so I think that it's a good tension. I, I, uh, I know a lot of people, I think, has, have viewed this film as very uh, against that or critical of it, but I didn't think of it that way. Miller and I certainly didn't feel that way when we were writing it. We were more thinking like, oh, like how are these guys going to handle that tension? But this, you d this is your, your um, field, isn't it? Like the, 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 the connection between commerce and science and how those two... I love how you're throwing it to me. That's so kind. I mean, a little bit. I think in terms of looking at these characters as being in opposition to each other, like do we pit technical expertise against kind of uh, a marketing and, and monetization element, probably structurally at companies, right? Um, but looking at some of the, the legacies of the BlackBerry, I mean the connection between hardware and software, right? BlackBerry Messenger being a little bit ahead of its time. If you are enjoying your group chat right now or messaging about how great this panel is or hate being left unread by your crush or anyone else, like these were seeded by that messaging system which kind of preceded this big hinge uh, with social media that went toward a, uh, the surveillance capitalism business model that we sort of see now. So, you know, you're, you're suggesting is there space for technical maybe perfection? Um, maybe that's a little bit more on the hardware side because we see software systems that can be updated and are updated. One final thing to just throw in there is, you know, initially with BlackBerry Messenger, the lack of interoperability was kind of a selling feature which drove devices, right? You, in order to BBM, you had to have a BlackBerry device. And later that system became open, but it was also pushed by 
Google when Android was giving away its operating system for free. Apple iMessage was also a closed system. So you see this kind of hinge between kind of walled gardens that felt more protected and maybe more invincible, which is why it's so exciting to think about the growth and kind of plummeting of this particular device. Um, but I think we have to put it in that, that historical context of all those other changes that were happening and the telecommunications company. That's more my jam. Is what? telecommunications? No, no, the, the context of competition. Oh, right. Yeah, you know, this is something that, I, that gets brought up at Q&As quite often or something that I'm often... Uh, <sighs> let me reframe it. The People think about BlackBerry as a failed company and this movie as a kind of Icarus, oh, yeah, well, they tried to do this and it failed, and so, of course, it's good content to make a movie about. Um, but that's only within this specific time. Like, it's only, like, right now that that makes sense. Like, I, c I can see in 10 years, let's say a device comes and completely removes the iPhone from any kind of market dominance. Well, they could make a very similar story about that. It's just that this movie got made now, mm. that it's specifically about this. And, it, like, on a long enough time frame, all companies, all products die. And in some ways, it's why I tried to stay fairly ignorant to what a BlackBerry actually did or what it was or like what happened at the company because I thought the more that the film was about the history specifically or the, the literal technical things that the phone did, the less relevant it was gonna be as time went on. And to me, it's like the dynamics between those three men were much more universal and useful for people to see. And I felt like that, well, that that was going to give the film like a like a reason to exist uh, beyond just uh, like a, a history piece as to what was happening in telco at this exact time at the late 90s, early 2000s. I even have a question about that. Um, yeah, how did you and, and Matthew Miller find that balance between, we, we need some technical exposition just because it has to be passed between the characters, right? The film has to explain why is so much more important, as you just said. So, you know, how do you uh, find a way through it on the page? How did you get the actors comfortable with it? Um, I, I noticed that most information, when there is real exposition, is being delivered as a screw you to somebody else. Like, this, oh is, yeah. why, this is why we're great. This is why my thing is the best. Um, which is just terrific behavior, especially for an actor like Glenn Howard, who just comes in and steamrolls. Uh, terrorizes everyone else in the room, and you, know, I, you must have noticed there. There's scene after scene after scene where, uh, where Mike is, you know, Jay Baruchel is putting as much physical space between himself and Howard, and even he's in the smart. cab, like he is pushing himself, like he's trying to keep away from arm's reach. He's he terrified of. He, well, he tries to always stay as close as possible to a door that he can leave out of, um, like as a character, I mean. Um, but th your your question, actually, this is advice I'm always giving filmmakers. Or anybody who's well, I'll just, just keep the filmmakers. If you if you are interested in interested in making a movie about anything, it helps knowing nothing about what that thing is, because beginner's mindset is so so valuable. Because what it means is that you need to teach yourself the fundamentals about whatever that thing is, so that you can understand it in a like grade five level. And that is about the level <laughs> that audiences want to receive technical information. Do you know what I mean? Like, you want it to be the kind of thing that you can explain to somebody in casual conversation, and it doesn't have to go deeper than that. Whereas, let's say, I'll take the example of the rim engineer who got on stage, okay? And was like, fuck you, fuck this movie, you got it all wrong, okay? He was right, you know? Like, from the perspective of an engineer who developed a cell phone, He's right, this movie doesn't accurately show exactly what it's like to build a phone in an engineering department in 2002, but who the fuck cares? Like, like only he and those other people would care. And so by having no baggage with this exact world or with this topic, it really helped Miller and I to understand what was essential about it. And so I would say a lack of knowledge and a lack of expertise in a subject is hugely useful as a storyteller because 
then you aren't, you know, there's nothing worse than watching an expert explain something to people and constantly go into these parenthetical statements where they're like, but this is really this, and you have to really understand this, and this is really important. It's not important. Like, like you can cut the Gordian knot by knowing less and just explaining it at a more base level. And that's what we did all the time, and we encouraged the actors to do the same thing. We never tried to teach anybody exactly how something worked. And to this day, I think I am one of the most ignorant people on telecommunications <laughs> in this country. Like, I have no idea. I don't even really know what's so great about a BlackBerry. <laughs> Vast. Um, if I were guest lecturing in your class about some of the public policy elements of this mm -hmm. film and or the Blackberry, one kind of very elegant part I would shout out would be uh, a line where the character of Jim is on the telephone about the modems. And there's this like throwaway line where it's like, we'll throw in this, this, and this, um, as long as you give us all the IP. Right? So this gesture at the value and power of intellectual property, I think was also kind of really nicely addressed and alluded to without digging into what does that mean and why is that so important? Um, and the real, I guess, not character of Jim Balsilli is somebody who is a champion for these elements for companies in Canada and innovation in a way that I think is a very cool kind of foil to the, the character in the film, right? This is a person who like testifies at parliamentary committee about what's important for companies in terms of how to compete and privacy and data. Specifically um, around IP as well. Mm -hmm, exactly. So again, just that having that line there and that gesture at this is valuable and coveted, this thing, intellectual property, without giving a lecture or a sermon is I think really cool. And the, the playfulness of the coworkers together, I keep alluding to BlackBerry Messenger in particular. I think that's what a lot of people think about when they think of that device. Um, but it was started as kind of like a skunk works in your playtime period, which not a lot of companies uh, support or promote anymore. We're doing after hours, I mean, now with, I guess, smartphones, we never really have a total after hours of work, but I think that uh, is significant too, just something to think about. If you guys haven't heard that term before, it's a beautiful term of art in the engineering world. Uh, I think it was began, began at NASA, and it's called, it's called Skunk Works, and essentially it means what engineers are doing, because engineers are so prolific, they always want it like they're crazy, and they, it's basically side projects that they have within a central company, and Google was famous for having a whole, I think they called it Google X. I don't remember, wh is that what it was called? What was their, that was their Skunk Works program? Basically, it's like, just go and do something. They had so much money that they just paid their engineers to go just do something. Oh, that was formal, but they wanted people with 20% of their time, which is like the equivalent of a workday, to dedicate, if you were expected to kind of do things off the side of your desk while you were at your desk, and previously more with uh, Shopify, I think they wanted people to also have like a Shopify store if you were working at the company, which I don't know if that's the exact same thing. No, but but it's a it's an amazing concept, and it's again we, we didn't want to go go into the philosophy behind it, but we certainly wanted to show what that culture was like, which is basically when I was young, I remember going and working on films with my friends and not feeling like I was at work. And so when you're doing something actively with your peers and you don't feel like you're working, the notion of going home at the end of the day or taking a break, like I like all of the typical vernacular of like the nine to five workday life don't apply. And so it leaves you in this place where, you know, you can follow any intuition into, oh, let's build this or let's do this or, and it's why this got brought up at the beginning of the conversation, Research in Motion was able to do something as diverse as invent the first smartphone and build film editing software that wins an Oscar. It's because they just had all the smart young engineers in one region of Canada and they were like, well, let's just fuck around and do whatever. The problem that they had was that they were so, let's just fuck around, like so much like Doug, that they were making so little money that they were gonna go bankrupt. And that's why Jim Balsilli had to show up. I mean, I'm basically reliving the story of, of the film, but that's what was so interesting to me when I was first reading about it. I was like, oh, this is just like me and my friends. If Matt Miller hadn't showed up, like, <laughs> like we, would have, we would have gone bankrupt just the same way. 
but you would have had fun. Like, you would have made things anyway, right? You, right up until you ran out of money. Yeah, but the problem is, in film, as soon as you run out of money, there's no more films. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Digital hadn't happened yet. I mean, you can uh, Adam McGowan was saying that he made Next of Kin for $25,000, which was mostly the cost of film stock and processing in, in 1984, and now you could probably shoot the film digitally for the same budget and get the same result, assuming you're Adam McGowan. It's, it's this remarkable conflict, because people are out there doing stuff that costs them nothing but the equipment they already have, uh, while working other jobs. Like, it, it, entertainment or, or creativity is now the side hustle rather than the job, the career. So it's even more of a, a miracle to actually have a career making movies, especially one like this, where you get to play within playing, right? Like, you create a reality where you're, you're replicating this creative freedom that you actually enjoy yourself in the moment. Y uh, right, like, how, like where it's resonant. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, I think that the only reason that any of my films have been successful is because I still approach them like like with that same mindset. Um, y you made a point about the ubiquity of digital video, and I think that it's a double-edged sword because while Adam McGoyan is right that now you could make that whole film for that same budget, the problem is now almost anybody can make... I th the democratization of this technology has made it so that I it's almost in everybody's hands, like the ability to make movies. Um, and so it's a lot harder to stand out. I and I think that is more of like a like in the minds of young people than it is a reality. I think because anybody can film anything, a lot of people that I meet think like, oh, well, what's the point? It's such a common refrain I find among young generation of filmmakers or wannabe filmmakers that are like, oh, why would I even bother? Oh, I'm just gonna suck. Everybody can do this now. And it is not the same as when, like I if you just happen to have a 60 millimeter camera in the 80s, it was like, oh my God, wow, we can make a movie and it'll be a big secret. And you were empowered. And it's why so many of those like breakout filmmakers from that era, you see them now and they're like buffoons. Like they're so stupid. And how did you ever make movies? So stupid. And it's just that back then, it really was you get lucky at having, being in the right place at the right time with the right resources to do it. Whereas now, in order to make it, especially like today, you really need to be on your game. Like you have to be quite sophisticated. Yeah, uh, but of course, that was that was the case with a lot of, I mean, commercial cinema from the 60s and 70s, in, well, not in Canada, but in the States, right? Like, there's stuff that we remember because it resonated, because it was actually made with talent and skill. Uh, we're sitting here at a Canada's top 10 screening. There's, you know, like, there's a reason Blackberry's here. It's not that... It was a weak year, yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, yeah. As he didn't say where you were in the 10. <laughs> yeah, well, alphabetically. Alphabetically. We're, we're high. Nice. With a B, <laughs> yeah. I have one more question for, for Vass. We've sort of covered it, but I want to get the specific answer because uh, uh -oh. I find this one fascinating. Uh, looking back now, um, do you think that the trajectory of the BlackBerry, near total adoption and then near instant obsolescence as soon as something sexier came in, um, is that typical of how we approach new technologies? Uh, do w is, is there a product now that's about to be abandoned for something else? Like, do you, do you feel that this is part of a cycle or is the BlackBerry unique in, in tech? You know, I was reading today about a new version of a dumb phone that's taking inspiration from the BlackBerry, which I think is, is pretty cool. Uh, do I think there's like a very hot rise and fall? I think we're very dependent on, or maybe overly dependent on influencer economies, something else you just read in the film that would be in my pantomime guest lecture that I'm telling you about now, right? Who are the adopters, right? Where do we see technologies being used? How does that kind of incentivize fast follows? Um, and what does it mean for their lifespan? Um, but they were also monetizing their product in a way that was transparent and ethical and different, right? At, again, at that time, it was pretty absurd to be messaging a lot on a phone, and uh, many cell phone plans had caps on the monthly number of text messages you could send. I remember when I was a teenager and had a cell phone, I, I, I don't even remember, did you really text? when you got your first phone. I, I was a utilitarian tech, I would be like, I have a ride home from the basketball game. Like yeah, I wasn't I like would. conversing. I, we had one phone, me and my roommates in university, we just shared it so we could communicate with our landline. We should have just had a walkie talkie. It was literally for whoever stayed at the library the longest <laughs> to have a phone. We'd be like, oh, do you need the phone? Like I have the phone. What am I telling you? Do I think things are hot and cold that fast? 
Um, no, I think there are, there's a lot of learning and that there's elements of endurance, but there were certainly elements of how the marketplace was changing that the company either failed to see or failed to appreciate when they were being told about it. And it occupies a very unique space in Canada's history, much with a lot of things that, a lot of elements that we should be proud of and sort of honor while also being fascinated with, as is much of which is captured. Uh, through the film. What about those hoverboards? Where are they? That's what I'm saying. In terms of the future of technology? But I'm saying they came and went. Or those fidget things. Fidget spinners? Yeah. Oh, that they go hot and cold? That things go fast and slow, you mean? Yeah, they're gone. I know. So are pogs and magic sticks. I had a good time with those, too. You know how much uh, cabbage I've patch heard dolls some talk there? about pogs, still. <laughs> really? They're coming yes. back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody look under your seat. Sorry. Everybody here got Everybody a slammer. Look under your seat. There's a pog. <laughs> I never get to do that. Um, I'm going to throw it to the audience. This is technically a science-adjacent uh, science Q&A, but if you have technical questions, wave your hand really hard. And if you just want to talk about the movie, that's also fine. Uh, sorry, uh, the light's right in my eyes. So uh, orange beanie? Orange toque? No, there's not. <laughs> well known. In this room. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm teasing you, but yes. You're wondering why. So what he's alluding to is that all the engineers, I had this idea where I would just cast tr young Toronto filmmakers who I knew were my friends. Um, and, but to say that they are well known is absurd, my friend. <laughs> That's ridiculous. The only one of them who's made a feature is Ethan Eng. And that has been seen by like a glorious 15 people worldwide. <laughs> so uh, the reason I did that was because Miller and I, early on, uh, I, I connection between filmmaking culture and engineering culture. And I didn't. I was best friends with engineers when I was growing up, like when I was in high school. They all went to Waterloo University, and the only way I could think to recapture that feeling was by surrounding myself with just sycophants who would just laugh at everything I said and do whatever I wanted, um, but also who were extremely smart. And I love talking to filmmakers, and also I find filmmakers are incredible actors. I don't know why. Like, for whatever reason, writer-directors, are great on camera, and I knew that we weren't gonna write those scenes, and that's the real secret. I did not want to have to write a bunch of bullshit for strangers to have to say, and for me to be like, no, nah, that's not really how you play this video game. Um, let, okay, we have to do another take of that. I wanted to just like roll the cameras and mess around with them for a few hours, and uh, I think that if we hadn't cast it that way, we never would have been able to shoot the film, ever. I every single scene that those guys are in, those young engineers, they have no lines. That's just us talking. Like they, they have, I think Ben Petrie, who has a feature premiering at Rotterdam Film Festival in a few months, his first feature, um, uh, he has that one speech where he, where he says that his girlfriend's cashing his checks and, and, uh, and he kept begging me to do more and more takes of that, by the way. And he would make a big joke like, I don't need another take, I don't need And then he'd find me in the hallway and be like, I need to do another take of that. I can do it funnier for Glenn. I know it. <laughs> that's real. Um, but, but otherwise, they have no written dialogue. And so that's why we did it. Because I, I knew that we could just uh, uh, vamp. All that stuff of Ethan in the message board. You see that stuff? He's on early uh, uh, IRC texting with people. That was a real board. There's a whole crazy story I could tell there. Where they were meeting people. That for some reason, there's a hacker community that has rebirth these original chat rooms. Like I know, you guys know what IRC is? It's like the old old school, like just all kinds of bad people hang out in there. <coughs> these places still exist. Yep. And our production designer built it. And so that we were in real IRC terminals, texting, with, like writing with people, trying to keep it like 90s, which people uh, just went with. So those conversations are all real. IRC conversations. So they're LARPing for you? They're, in a way, <laughs> they were. But they really are just being themselves. Everybody was just being themselves. Yeah. That's wonderful. Oh, um, sorry. Right here. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a film journalist with tech background, so I was, I was looking at a bit of tech news here. So I was, and it's interesting that the, the BlackBerry, like, ushered in the new age 
terms of like data, but like data was essentially like extra on both sides. So at some point I had a like hand-me-down BlackBerry Mini, but I never I used it as a phone because the data plan was extra, and it was not until I got an iPhone that I was forced to get a data plan. So just um, what what is like the so BlackBerry died, but like it left its mark on the world. That's right. <laughs> uh, I think I'll leave this to you. Yeah, that's. <laughs> do, you, do you have a? Is there the idea, the the appeal of getting a BlackBerry just to have a BlackBerry at that time, even if you couldn't afford the data plan? It sort of comes back to the idea of it as the thing that everybody had to have for that little tiny. But moment. you know what? This movie actually mm. ends before that era began. Like, th you could not get a data plan on your BlackBerry in 2007. Right, because it's coming. Yeah, it was only afterwards. It gets alluded to. Um, but, uh, so I actually literally have no knowledge of that whatsoever. L but but uh, I, know, I, I, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, because I thought there were no data plans on these Blackberries, right. from what I know. The later models had them because you had to com they had to compete, right? Is that when, what, when BlackBerry adopted uh, Android? I think, as their operating system to just guarantee they could stay alive a little longer? Sorry, I'm asking. I'm asking yeah, I have if no idea. Getting this dead eyed stare. Yeah, I, look, I know that the big like, cash model that Jim Balsilli came up with was that he, this is back, this is, this is some, some very cool Canadiana, which is that Rogers and Bell had these huge data networks that nobody was using especially in the 90s and early 2000s. And so BlackBerry, Jim specifically was so cagey that he was like, oh, why don't we just permanently buy, uh, th I'm using vague language here, but permanently buy a huge section of data from Rogers and Bell that they're not rent it to our consumers. And so we will basically buy this stuff wholesale and then sell it to the people buying our uh, Blackberries. And that's what they did. And so when you bought a BlackBerry, you didn't just buy the BlackBerry, you also had to pay Research in Motion directly. I think it was $10 a month, but I don't know if I have that number right. And then after like four or five years, Rogers and Bell realized that they were just getting fucked on this deal because they were basically, now all of a sudden this data was so valuable and Research in Motion had figured out a way to turn it into something valuable, but they'd made this deal for like seven or eight years or something like that. And so that's really how they were making their money. It wasn't just in handset sales. It was in this data subscription or like BlackBerry subscription that they gave to consumers. But again, I, I learned all about this uh, afterwards. Um, some interesting elements of this are covered in uh, Dogfight which is sort of a complimentary read to the, the Jackie McNish and Sean Silkoff book, Losing the Signal, um, which I think illustrates the role of telecommunication carriers, again, as potentially blocking innovations. And, uh, you know, there was a changed mindset when it comes to app stores, too. And app stores and apps were something that also drove adoption of the iPhone. Um, yeah, sorry that I'm saying um, it's such a bad affectation. <laughs> Just like the bone I'm throwing you in terms of a quick reaction. And it's, all, and it's also, also like ironic that the screen was at the tip of that light box because not, I think many people don't realize that BlackBerry used to be a sponsor of Tip and the Founders Lounge was originally the BlackBerry's lounge when the light box opened in 2010. That's correct. <laughs> tip light box, by the way. <laughs> I know, I know. I um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a message. Uh, our time is up. Uh, <laughs> this doesn't work, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Matt, Bass, uh, for the world premiere of the 35 millimeter print. And you know what? <laughs> it matters. Yes, yeah. it does. I yes, agree. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And thank you for coming to this screening, especially those of you who I'm sure have seen this before. All the oh. Ben Shanes out there logging this for the fifth time on Letterbox. <laughs> it was about 50-50. But yeah, thank you for coming out. Thank you for supporting Canadian film. Uh, thank you for letting us close out top 10 in style. Thank you all for coming. And those of you watching online, thank you for watching yes, online. Yes, good night, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Good Bye. night, everybody. Bye. People were like, oh, there we go. We are back. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Were there any other questions? <laughs>